Our next speaker is Dr. David Jens. And David is going to talk about cameras that were high on Everest, including the Retina camera and others. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the applause. Um, the cameras I'm going to be talking about are uh, restricted strictly to the 1953 British Everest expedition that uh, made the final uh, successful ascent of Mount Everest and involved uh, Sir Edmund Hillary along with other notable historical individuals. In the, uh, in the following of any adventure on Everest, topography is important because when I show you a photograph, you'll have to understand where it's being taken on the mountain. And what I've included on the last page of your handout, if you flip it over and look at your last cover page, is this exact map done by the Indian Air Force showing Mount Everest, its summit, south summit, adjacent mountain called Losi, and the route that was taken to in the conquest of Everest. One area that I did not mention is called the Western Coombe. This is a snowy area that becomes a glacier and there's this very treacherous ice fall below it. Now, when I saw this photograph, I thought getting there is half the fun. <laughs> and what this is, is a giant crevasse just above Camp 3 in the Western Coombe before they established Camp 4. And certainly you couldn't pay me enough to do this. What I'm going to show you through this talk is that I give these uh, individual photographs that I, I acquired from the Royal Geographical Society as original scans of the original Kodachromes. <laughs> and underneath that, in blue, you will see the photographer, the camera, sometimes the film, sometimes the exposure. The reason I have this kind of data is from books from Alfred Gregory. Other than that, if you've ever done any reading on the Everest Adventure, there is little to no information on photographic techniques, apparatuses, or anything. They just say, I took my camera and did this. That is certainly all the history you will find. We start out with Tom Stobart. He is the uh, individual that did most of the movie filming. He, uh, had six different cameras to choose from. Two of them were a Bell & Howell Filmo 70DL. And uh, from this, uh, the conquest of Everest was made. It was filmed in 16 millimeter Kodachrome and transferred to Technicolor for print. This was done in cooperation with the Royal Geographical Society and the Alpine Club, but this was a commercial adventure. Of course, the film was primarily done by Thomas Sobard, but he was no kind of high altitude climber, and the high altitude photography was done by George Lowe. More on Mr. Lowe later. The leader of the Everest expedition was John Hunt, later to become Brigadier Sir John Hunt, later to become Lord Hunt. Here is a photograph of him taken by Sir Edmund Hillary on the south call, and around his neck is a pre-war Contax 2 camera with what we think is a 50 millimeter lens and you'll always see the universal use of a lens hood and an ultraviolet filter, which is pretty smart because you'll find in this history, although this is 1953, the majority of cameras on Everest that took the majority of historical photographs were pre-World War II photograph or cameras, okay? Now the reason I show him with this contacts is the writing of Sir Edmund, excuse me, the writing of Alfred Gregory states that he owned a Leica. And here I find a photograph of him with a contacts around his neck. So what's that all about? Well, I did find him with the Leica, which gladdened Rolf Fricke's heart, of course. And what I found it in was when I did screen captures from the actual movie, The Conquest of Everest, which is available on DVD and you can also see on YouTube, Alf Gregory's book said he used a Leica 3 with a Lights Elmar, well, he used, said he used a Leica, but didn't say a Leica 3, but it had a Lights Elmar lens. The way I figured this was a Leica 3 was I actually sent these screen captures to Rolf Fricke and to my co-editor, Peter Rosner. They both confirmed the camera he's using is a Leica 3, 
but because of the ro low resolution, we can't tell you the exact model. Sir John Hunt died in 1998, and we'd have to do further exploration to find out what this Leica was. Alfred Gregory, most people view Alfred Gregory as the chief photographer of the expedition, and in fact, he was in charge of still photography, but Alf Gregory was a mountaineer first and a photographer second. He once quipped, I went to Everest as an amateur and left as a professional. Here we can see Alf Gregory with also with a pre-war contacts too and a 135 millimeter f4 lens along with a multi-finder. It turns out that the contacts two cameras on this expedition probably had two sources. In Sir John Hunt's book, one source is Time Life magazine. Time Life magazine gave, according to Sir John Hunt's book, contacts cameras and biogon lenses to the expedition. Also, Sir excuse me, Alfred Gregory himself owned a Contax 2 camera. He, since he was the chief still photographer, he goes around Everest like a Japanese tourist, and he has this Rolleiflex Automat and this Retina 1 camera, which are viewed here, the Rolleiflex and the Retina. Now, unfortunately, history has its problems. And what happened is, in one of his books, Alf Gregory's Everest, he notes that his Rolleiflex, his Retina 2, and his contacts were all in one bag at one time and were stolen from him. So I can give you no technical information on those cameras, although I can show you the photographs he took with them. Also of note is the contacts was his favorite main color camera, but when he went high on Everest, he only took the more compact Retina camera. He shot Kodachrome primarily as his color film, I read that he used a lot of Panatomic X with the Rolleiflex Automat. The Automat went as high as the South Call, which is 26,000 feet. This is correspondence between myself and Alf Gregory back in 2003. I wrote him about information about his retinue camera. He told me it was stolen, which is also what he states in the book. No serial number information is available to me. He felt that the focus scale was in feet and the camera was given to him by Kodak. He didn't say whether it was Kodak Limited or Eastman Kodak. I'm guessing it's Kodak Limited, but that's purely a guess on my part. He was also kind enough to tell me George Lowe's address so I could contact him, and he told me that Tom Bordillon had been killed in an Alpine mountaineering accident. I found out later that was in 1956. Why that's relevant, you'll see in a second. There's additional cameras used that were given by uh, other sources. Here uh, we see the Sherpas are lining up for a portrait. This is uh, Tom Sobard filming them. This is Alf Gregory taking his usual copious notes. And this camera right here is the one of interest. It turns out that the silhouette back of this camera turns out to be a Super Icona C, which is a six by nine format camera. And if you have any doubts about the identification of that camera, Stephen Gandy was kind enough to allow me his images of a Super Icona C from his website, and you can tell that the back view of that camera is virtually identical to that. In Alfred Gregory's book, he talks about the photo editor of the Times of London. The Times of London had the only um, rights to the Everest story for its announcement. They had sole rights to it, and they also were aiding Alf Gregory in photography, but the photo editor had no trust of the 35 millimeter format. So the photo editor hands him this uh, super Icona C to use on Everest. He said, fine camera, beautiful Zeiss lens, terribly clumsy and awkward. No one will use this thing and risk their life on Everest with this clunky camera, okay? So that was his uh, answer to that. <laughs> George Lowe. George Lowe is another New Zealander like Edmund Hillary. Both these gentlemen are New Zealand climbers. They have been in the Himalayas before in 51 and 52. He is a very close friend to Sir Edmund Hillary. And you will see often there are photographs of Sir Edmund Hillary taking George Lowe or George Lowe taking Sir Edmund Hillary. And he is, while he's a mountain climber, what he actually did for a living was he was a uh, grade school teacher in a place called Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. 
And he was a great cut up, a great jokester on the thing, but he was an excellent climber and he was responsible for paving the way up the mountain to get them to the final camp where Tenzing and Norgay will finally get to the summit of Mount Everest. So he's a very strong climber. In my research, I found that his camera was a type 142 Kodak Retina 2, gave me the serial number, gave me the lens serial number, and from those and my knowledge, I found that this camera was produced in 1938. This is a Question, uh, a letter returned to me by George Lowe, and where he answered the questions I had posed to him about the camera then to make a proper identification. I knew if it was a Retina 2 and had a Xenon 2.8 lens, it had to be a pre-war camera. So I gave him the photograph of the three pre-war Retina 2 cameras that were in existence. He dutifully gives me wonderful information, serial numbers, it had a metric focus scale, a German depth of field scale. He tells me he used it in, in India, on Cho Yu in 51, on Everest in 53, on Makula, which is a mountain 12 miles from Everest in 54, and that he doesn't have time to give me any photographs of the camera because of the 50th anniversary of Everest celebration. And I ask him to identify which one, and he gets it wrong. He calls it the 122, it's really the 142. There's no way those serial numbers fit a 122 camera. You have to take my word on that. We don't have time to prove that. George Lowe here, changing his film, but actually I am going to prove it to you in these photographs. This is a wonderful photograph. Al Gregory took it at 27,300 feet. They're on their way up to the highest camp before the summit, and here's George, and he's sitting there with the camera open on his knee, and there's a little yellow box in his hand that's Kodachrome. And after he loads the film up, this is Hillary and Tensing still taking a rest on the mountainside, and there's the camera in his left hand. And when I blow this up and I compare it to an existing camera from my collection, we find that the basal view, which I've reprodu reproduced here, and the side view, which I've reproduced here, are virtually identical. This proves he had a Type 142 Retina 2 camera on Everest. This particular model I'm showing you is <laughs> less than 200 serial numbers away from his camera, so they were probably soulmates in production. Tom Bordillon was part of the first assault team along with a gentleman named Charles Evans. Tom Bordillon is a strong climber. He was described to be have a rugby-like physique, and he and Charles Evans did an incredible climb uh, as the first assault team to get to the top. They started from the south call at 26,000 feet and made it all the way to the south summit at 28,700 feet. And at the time, Tom Bordillon had a Kodak Retinet camera. I get that information from Alf Gregory's book, The Picture of Everest. Well, what happens? Well, here's two things happen. First of all, they get terribly fatigued from going from an elevation of 2,700 feet. They're using a closed circuit oxygen system. It had its problems. By the time they get to this south summit, which is less than 300 feet from the actual summit, which you can't actually see here, they are pooped, they are fatigued, their oxygen is not working correctly, they know to continue further is suicidal, so they turn back down, okay? But that doesn't stop Tom from taking a few photos. So here we are, so near yet so far, he's sitting here on the south summit of Everest. He's the highest anyone's ever been on Everest to date, but they just don't have the energy or the oxygen to make it. He does take a picture of Evans on the south summit at 28,700 feet, May the 26th, 1953. For a three-day period, these gentlemen hold the record for being the highest men on Everest. Here they come back to the south call. These guys are pooped. Their oxygen kind of gave out, and they just, they're just, you know, fatigued squared, and, and Tensing here is come by to see them, and I read in a couple of books that what he's doing is offering them uh, whatever he can, oxygen, a hot drink, whatever support he can to get them over this terrible fatigue. Beautiful Kodachrome by Alf Gregory using his Retina 2 camera, F8 one hundredth of a second. George Band. George Band is the youngest member of the expedition team. 
He's a student at this time. I believe he belonged to some Oxford Climbing Society, and he was chosen uh, amongst the 12 climbers to go. He takes a wonderful photograph of the second assault party. The, the second assault party consisted of uh, Hensing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary, and they're about to leave the advanced base camp for, for, for the South Call on May the 25th. This wonderful photograph, he picked up one of the Contax 2 cameras with a wide-angle Biogon lens, shot it in Kodachrome. There's the exposure. This photograph was given a full page in Life magazine and also in National Geographic magazine when they published. On to Sir Edmund Hillary. What's the first photo historical publication that Sir Edmund Hillary used a Kodak retina on Everest? It's this document right here from Mark James Small. He published about this in the Zeiss Historica Journal. He wrote, uh, Mr. Small got a hold of the Himalayan Trust uh, address, wrote to Sir Edmund Hillary. Sir Edmund Hillary is the nicest guy in the world, let me clue, or was, let me clue you. That's um, because he died. No, he's the nicest guy in the world. Let me clue you, he was. Um, Mark Small was hoping that Sir Edmund had used the context camera and the Biogon lens on the summit. Uh, uh, uh. Mark Small was disappointed to read it's a Kodak retina camera, which was fairly ancient even in those days, interesting statement, and it had a Compour shutter and Zeiss Tessar lens. Mark Small surmises this is a type 126 retina because that's the only one described in 1993 is having a Zeiss Tessar lens that would have the problem with double exposure. Unfortunately, Mark is wrong because there's no such thing as a Compour shutter on a 126. They all had Compour rapid shutters. My friend in Germany, Uli Fott, knew this fact and sent photographs to Sir Edmund Hillary later that year to identify just exactly which retina it was with the Zeiss Tessar lens and he identified it as most being like a type 18, and he was quite correct. Sir Edmund Hillary is viewed here at Lake Camp with Hunt, and this is a wonderful photograph because it's one of the few color photographs I had where the camera is actually around his neck. This was taken by George Lowe with his type 142, so a retina photographs a retina. Sir Edmund Hillary from New Zealand also is a beekeeper. His father and his brother and himself uh, have that farming business, beekeeping, and he's also an avid climber, obviously, and was chosen for this expedition. And it's a funny little story I'll tell you real quick. The, um, the uh, press would ask him, hey, you go off on these expeditions that take two and three months, and who's taking care of your farm business while you're gone all that way? And, and Sir Edmund Hillary says, well, he says, well, I'll remind you, I'm a beekeeper, and most of my workers need very little supervision. <laughs> so here's the fabled camera around the fabled individual's uh, neck, and this is kind of a man moment to machine kind of situation like you see on the History Channel. And I had the pleasure of actually seeing this camera at Explorers Hall in the National Geographic Society in April of 2003 before it went on display for the 50th anniversary <laughs> celebration of the summiting of Everest. And it is indeed a type 118 retina camera. This is its serial number, 513460. Indeed, a Carl Zeiss Jena lens and a Compour shutter has a foot focus scale. It had been modified for mountain use. Right here is an extension that has been soldered on to the lever called the film release lever. This is a little lever you push on a retina to be able to make, uh, move to the next film frame and be able to advance the film. There's no double exposure prevention here. You took a picture, hit the film release, wound it, and it would go eight clicks and take you to your next frame. Well, as you can imagine, this is the normal film release lever. You are not gonna be able to operate that with thick gloves on. So he had somebody elegantly solder on this little gray piece of metal onto his retina. I thought that was the greatest find. Here we are. I, mean, I don't know if you can read this very well, but Made in Germany is stamped on the back leather of that particular retina. That has some meaning for marketing of retinas in the pre-war time. 
any retina that has made in Germany stamped on its back leather was bound for the United Kingdom, because that is how the marketing worked. There was a requirement for cameras exported to the United Kingdom or to the United States to have made in Germany on them somewhere. Well, in the United States, Eastman Kodak chose to have it engraved on the tripod mount, and for some reason, the United Kingdom wanted it stamped on the leather. Don't ask me why, I wasn't at that meeting, okay? This is the bottom of Sir Edmund Hillary's camera. You can see it's a feet focus scale, obviously because it's meant for an English speaking market. This number here looks like it's an accession number, which all our wonderful museum curators love to put on equipment. What's some facts about this camera? Well, it truly was sold with a Tessar lens because I had some doubting Thomases as to whether this was reality or not. Well, here's proof that it was reality. Kodak Limited ad. Here we are, the camera's offered with Xenar lenses, it's offered with Tessar lenses, and it's offered with two different shutter types, the Compour that goes to a 1 300th of a second, and the Compour Rapid that goes to 1 500th of a second. So if you're in the United Kingdom in 1935 and you wanted to buy one of these Zeiss Tessar Compour Rapid cameras, you had to lay out 12 pounds, 10. I don't know what the 10 stands for. Shillings. Shillings, thank you. <laughs> okay. Little facts known. If you look at previous publications, Co and Kemmler, this is of course English and German, they give a production figure of 9,000 to 9,144 type 18 retina cameras produced. Wrong, nope. We have the serial number statistics <coughs> from hundreds of cameras that are one, type 118 cameras and when you look at the identified serial number data, you get a production figure of 39,300 plus. Now, how many would have Tessar lenses? Only 4% of the type 118 retina cameras in the database have a Zeiss Tessar lens. And if you coupled it together with cameras that have a Zeiss Tessar lens, a Compo Rapid shutter, and have United Kingdom market attributes, you're talking 1%. So for you to find a camera precisely like Sir Edmund Hillary, you got a chance of maybe there's about 390 to 400 cameras in the world that look like this. Well, I got one on eBay from London, okay? <laughs> More historic photographs by Alf Gregory. This is a beautiful photograph. You know, this is just history in the making. Again, a scan from the actual uh, Kodachrome from the National Geographic, I mean, excuse me, the Royal Geographical Society. Alf Gregory took this. They're on their way up the southeast ridge to the final camp. This is Sir Edmund Hillary and Tensing Norgay. Another wonderful photograph taken by George Lowe, his pal, who's, who's actually doing all the work to get him up there. What they did was they would send an advanced team. They would cut the steps so that the guys who actually want to summit it wouldn't be so fatigued that they would be fresh for the next day to get the actual summit. It's, it's, it's a teamwork, okay? So George Lowe takes this wonderful photograph from 27,500 feet when they're on their way up to establish Camp 9. And this photograph to me just illustrates cold and danger personified. Let me tell you something about this, about this ridge here. If you make one misstep and head this direction, you've got a 10,000 foot drop to become a gravy spot on a glacier, okay? If you make a misstep in this direction, it's an 8,000 foot drop to the western coombe, okay? This is how, how narrow this ridge is they're on. This is not for the faint of heart. We're getting close to the summit here, and what I'll tell you is the night before when they uh, Tensing and Hillary stay on the high camp, and the rest of them go back down the mountain to the South Coal. Uh, Sir Edmund, in his writing, tells me that he put a new roll of Kodachrome film in his retina camera the night before and set the exposure at one tenth of a second and f of 11 because that's the exposure he was taught for a wonderful sunny day on the top of Everest. And he, before he starts out at 6:30 a.m. from this camp, the camp was at 27,900 feet. Yeah. He uh, double checks the exposure setting on it and they start out. By nine o'clock in the morning, they make it to the south summit where Bordillon and Evans had been there three days before. So now they're, they're tied. 
And they took this view from the south summit, and I'll tell you something funny about this very slide you're looking at. I've seen three books say this view is from the south summit, including Sir Edmund Hillary's book. If you get the Life magazine, they'll tell you that photograph was taken from the summit. Uh -uh. But that's how history goes, okay? This was taken from the south summit, 300 feet below the regular summit, okay? This, this uh, mountain right here is called Makula. At this point, it is unclimbed. That mountain must be extremely big because this is supposed to be 12 miles away from Everest, and you're looking at a normal lens photograph. That thing is big. This other mountain clear in the background to the best of my pronunciation is Kengchengunga. It is the third highest mountain in the world. This photograph was taken at something called the step. We're now on the summit roll, and the National Geographic Society was nice enough to give me a small little contact proof of the Kodachromes right here. This is kind of cool. I know this is the last photograph taken before they get to the summit because of this series. This photograph is taken at something that was later named the Hillary Step he encountered a vertical rock position that was 40 feet straight vertical. And he stopped and he thought, if I can't make this, I've got to at least take a photograph to prove I got this high. So that's what this photograph represents. This was the south summit. And you can see the footprints right along the rock here where, they, where, they're, where they're making their way up to the summit. And why they're right along the rock here is I'll tell you about these things. Those are called cornices, OK, our cornices. And those are merely big, fluffy piles of snow. You set foot on one of those, you get another 10,000-foot trip down the mountain. This is the wonderful, famous photograph taken on the summit of Tenzing. And of course, he unfurls the flags of the United Nations, uh, United Kingdom, Nepal, and India. And actually, there were three photographs taken by Sir Edmund Hillary, and number two is the winner for history. This photograph was listed recently by Time Life magazine in a special edition of Life magazine as one of the 100 most significant and influential photographs of the 20th century. And I agree. I can remember this from grade school. Now, why is there no photograph of Sir Edmund Hillary on the summit? He once quipped, amongst Tenzing Norgay's skills, photography isn't, and he felt that the top of Everest was no place to conduct classes. <laughs> <laughs> they only spent 15 minutes and got out of there. While they're there, though, he has to prove he's at the summit, so he takes pictures in the east to show the mountains again. Towards the west, again, mountains, including a mountain they climbed on the two years previous, and a beautiful view of a glacier. Photos to the northeast, south to the Hungu Valley. And the most significant photo is this one looking down the north edge of Everest towards Kangxi and showing the Rongbuk Glacier. This was the route in the 20s and 30s that the great climbers attempted uh, Everest, including Irving and Mallory. And according to the National Geographic of July 54, this photo could only have been taken from the summit. It proves he summited Everest. On their way back, he noticed that there was a beautiful view of this summit, again, from the south summit. They got there by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He noticed his steps coming down the mountain. He thought, that's worth recording. And at this point, he even noticed that beside the cold conditions, my camera worked quite well. They get back, and there's a lot of celebration. But we can skip over that in the interest of time and come to a summation of the findings. Six highest cameras during the 53 Everest expedition, as best as I can tell from my research. Of course, Sir Edmund Hillary's right to the top, the Type 118 with his ice tessar. Tom Bordillon took his retinette to 28,700 feet. Two retina twos with Alf Alfred Gregory and George Lowe to Camp 5. Now, the question here is contacts versus Leica versus John Hunt to the Southeast Ridge. And the reason that question exists is that John Hunt took a picture of Bordillon and Evans at about 27,000 feet, but I have no idea which camera he used. I'm betting on the contacts, too, because the photograph you saw of Sir John Hunt with the contacts, too, was taken when he returned from that point at the South Call by 
Sir Edmund Hillary, and then the Roloflex made it to the South Call. The majority of the cameras were owned by the climbers, as Gregory noticed in his book, climbers were loath to change from the cameras they were used to handling. None of them were specifically treated for the extreme cold, although they had been given cameras treated that way. What they did was simply keep them warm in their clothing as they climbed, and they had to keep them in their sleeping bags as they uh, slept at night or when they were relaxing. Uh, Alfred Gregory once said that a camera is a very uncomfortable bedfellow. <laughs> it appears Alf Gregory did an excellent job of teaching photographic technique, as every time I see a camera in a photograph, there's a lens hood and a UV filter on it, and that the exposures appear spot on, in my opinion, as I feel Kodachrome at that time with an ASA of 10 was an unforgiving film for under overexposure. The Everest climb uh, and uh, summiting occurs at the exact same time as the coronation of Queen Elizabeth so that the papers have a lot to rave about. And I found this wonderful photograph of Sir Edmund Hillary with the Type 118 retina in his hand and this strange cap that he wore that always made me think of an Egyptian pharaoh. By the way, that cap, I found out, was made by his sister-in-law, Jenny. Of course, the public is greatly enthralled by this, and there's, there's publications from the Times that are color supplements, and of course, Life Magazine covers this. These three photographs, as you can see, an iconic one I showed you from Alf Gregory before, all these were taken with his Retina 2 camera. Now, not to be left out, the highest photographs on Earth, Kodak states, were made on Kodak film. And later, they learned that a retina camera was used. This is a July advertisement. Then they start using the wonderful classic photograph with the uh, permission of the Himalaya Committee in their ads. And finally, the Germans get in on the act by having the retina camera off the highest peak of the world. Of course, they use a little poetic license and show the latest model of retina, not this ratty old 118 from pre-war. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.